Thank you all for standing by and welcome to our webinar entitled Monitoring New Contaminants in Public Drinking Water Sources. This is a webinar series called Freshwater Science that will highlight Ohio Sea Grant and partnering scientists every month. Every quarter is a different focus from human health and fish farming to harmful algal blooms and human decision making bringing applied research to the public on issues that affect our Lake Erie communities. I am Jill Gentis Benicki from Ohio Sea Grant Stone Laboratory, and joining me today is Dr. Jen Mao from Kent State University. Dr. Mao is an associate professor within the Department of Biological Sciences at Kent State University. Her lab focuses on linking bacterial phylogeny with their metabolic functions in natural aquatic environments. Recent research projects of hers include looking at bacterial transformation of dissolved organic nitrogen in marine and freshwater environments, monitoring the coronavirus in wastewater, and pharmaceuticals and personal care products, or PPCPs, those impacts to our drinking water, which is what she'll be discussing with us today. Uh, we're delighted to have Dr. Mal here to discuss her research. Uh, before we do that, just a few um, mentions about the logistics of our webinar. During our presentation, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Afterwards, about 12.20, we'll, I'll uh, conduct a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question during the presentation, please feel free to pull up that chat feature anytime during uh, Dr. Mao's talk, and I will collect and pose your questions out to her at the end of her presentation. Uh, as a reminder, this webinar is um, auto has auto captioning and is being recorded to be posted onto our website for later viewing. Also, we will post a webinar survey in the chat feature toward the end of the half an hour. Uh, please take a few minutes after the webinar to fill out that survey. It will help us continue to bring you better webinars. So without any further delay, I'd like to introduce Dr. Mao presenting monitoring new contaminants in public drinking water sources. Thank you, Jill, for the introduction. I'm trying to share my screen now. Okay, can you see the slideshow now? I can. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, a, a very small correction, so I'm not uh, a full professor now. Okay. Uh, so, and um, yeah, so uh, I'm so excited uh, to have this great opportunity to report our study on monitoring new contaminants in public drinking water sources. And this new contaminants, as uh, Jill has reviewed, are PPCPs, pharmaceuticals and personal care products. It includes thousands of compounds um, from prescription and over-the-counter medications to our daily use hand soap, uh, sunscreen, and et cetera. And PPCPs are produced and consumed with a high amount on the daily basis. And Americans actually are the largest consumer of prescribed medications. Over 70% of our population is using one prescription per day, and a quarter are uh, using uh, over five pres prescriptions per day. And uh, in 2016, there are 4.5 billion medical prescriptions have been made. And um, along with personal care products and uh, PPCPs are uh, consumed and used, and um, their residual will be passing, let me use my data pointer. And the residue will go along with our feces and urines and our wastewater going to the wastewater treatment plant. And uh, after certain level of removal, some of the residue will be releasing into the natural surface water. And wastewater affluent is the known, one of the major point sources of PPCPs in our surface water. And there are many other non-point sources of PPCPs too. And one important example is agriculture runoff. So um, due to the uh, persistent use and input, it is expected that PPCPs probably have wide distribution in our surface water. Um, and we did a, a, a meta-analysis that collected um, the studies of PPCPs in natural stream in the past two decades also. And indeed that uh, we found that um, over 80% of the site that has been uh, studied um, that has positive detection of PPCPs. And in about 163 sampling sites, over 100 of PPCPs are detected. 
and um, the this the good news of this is um, the let me sorry let me remove this thing if I can okay so and uh, the matter of PPCPs are typically at pretty low concentration in most of the size so it's at micrograms uh, per uh, liter level or lower. And that is much lower than the uh, designed concentrations for some of the pharmaceutical compounds. So the question is, um, so they are potentially everywhere. And uh, however, they are at very low concentration. Should we still be worried about it? Um, the answer is uh, yes, at least for wildlife. We, still, we already have really solid evidence to indicate that uh, animals um, including both vertebrate and invertebrate animals, uh, especially when their size is small, uh, exposing to uh, environmental level uh, concentration of PBCPs can uh, make uh, the problem in their immune system and development and reproduction. And also low concentrations of antibiotics in the natural environment, we know that it is a really, uh, it can significantly increase the chance of uh, the generating of antibiotic resistant bacteria. And, uh, and antibody resistant bacteria opposing uh, a high risk to uh, human public health. Um, and for human um, um, perspective study, so the, at this low concentration of PPCPs, there's no, uh, there's no study that's showing acute uh, immediate uh, consequences of exposing to uh, environmental level of PPCPs. Uh, however, um, people are more concerned about even though we are at low concentration, but um, the chronic lung exposure, whether that's going to cause the issue is not clear, especially um, many of the pharmaceutical compounds are designed um, to use uh, just by itself. Um, but when we put them in a really complex mi mixture, when hundreds of different pharmaceutical compounds are in the water with, uh, even though with low concentration, whether that's going to be an issue, we have uh, not a very good clear idea about it. And also sometimes the low concentrations doesn't stay low. Uh, through a process called bioaccumulation, that low concentration in the water can be accumulated uh, through the food chain uh, into small animals. There are studies already showing that, um, so for, uh, for small fish, after incubating them into the, uh, actually this is the natural environment, um, after 14 days, um, in the um, fish um, blood and in the fish tissues, we can see um, the targeted pharmaceutical compound. They can um, be concentrated by uh, tens or even hundreds times higher uh, in, uh, in the fish. And that concentration can even go higher when the food chain moving up and finally reach uh, human if we are fishing and eat that fish. So, um, and another way for PPCPs that get, that get to human is through drinking water. Once they release into the surface water, so they can be uh, moving into the, our even protected uh, drinking water sources. And um, our, we know that our current uh, drinking water supply process, they're not designed uh, to remove uh, such compound. So, and their uh, removal efficiency uh, are not studied well. So we don't know much about whether the PPCPs uh, will, so there's high chance that they will be in our drinking waters the sources, but uh, we don't know much about like how much they will be removed and whether some of them will still be present, um, pre present in the uh, finished water. So a quick summary, so even at low concentration of PPCPs in our natural environment, uh, it is still pretty concerning because we don't know the long-term and combined impact of PPCPs on the health of wildlife and human. And um, PPCPs has been uh, identified as contaminants of concern of emerging concern by EPA for a while. However, the studies on PPCP uh, natural distribution uh, are still uh, very, very limited. Uh, we still have very limited knowledge on their distribution. So one, um, one, one potential impact, uh, one potential cause of this is because measuring PPCPs, we're talking about nanogram per liter and microgram per liter level that is very, very, uh, diluted concentration, it is very challenging. Um, for a commercial lab to measure this, it costs hundreds of dollars per sample for one compound. Okay, so to tackle this uh, knowledge gap, so um, funded by Ohio uh, Sea Grant, so uh, we are aimed to uh, 
do our some initial study to try to see whether PPCPs are actually invading our source and finished drinking water uh, in our local drinking water plants. And also we want to explore uh, whether we can use uh, molecular methods to have a, a fast and cheaper way to uh, predict the concentration of some of the PPCP compound in this case will be antibiotics uh, in, the, uh, in the water. So we get our um, water from four local uh, drinking water plants. And um, so as you can see, so they are, they are pretty much similar, um, but they have slight difference. Um, one of the uh, important differences is one of the water treatment plants has uh, adopted uh, also um, advanced oxidation process. And we are picking 14 PPCP compounds based on literature that indicating they have the high chance to present uh, in natural environment. So we get our sample from all four plants, um, both source and finished water. And in 2018 and 2019, monthly from May to September, and we did the tedious uh, step to um, measure their concentration. And uh, the answer, yes. So we found them, uh, we found PPCPs in all four uh, drinking water plants in their source water pool. Uh, all of the 14 compounds we are detecting, uh, we never see three of them, uh, acetaminophen, estrin, and nicotine, we never see them. Um, and all the other 11 compounds, we see them uh, in, the, uh, in the, depending on where and what time we're talking about. Um, so, but we see them in, the, uh, in the, our water samples. And one thing I want to mention is uh, the detection that our measured concentration are at nanogram per level, uh, per liter. So this is a uh, pretty low concentration uh, compared to the currently uh, like reported concentration in other places. So, so that is uh, pretty good news. And uh, another thing that we can catch is this blue and orange color um, bar indicating, um, so they're showing in all four panels um, and also in all of the uh, different sampling uh, time. So, those are uh, caffeine and estradiol. So they are found in all source water samples, has 100% uh, frequency of detection. The other uh, nine compounds, so depending on the time and size, they're showing up with different uh, levels. So this is source water. Let's look at the finished water. And um, so, so the finished water is in the striped, striped bars. So uh, a good thing we see that the, uh, the total PPCP concentration all dropped by um, like um, 60, um, 60 to 80%, um, um, 60 to 80% across all of the uh, water treatment plants. So, so therefore our current uh, drinking water uh, process actually are pretty effective in removing a majority of the, uh, the PPCP compounds. And um, so I will show this uh, figure, probably show this a little bit better. So this is a, a overall average of all different individual PPCP compounds that have positive detection in, uh, in, in any of the four uh, plants that we are looking at. Uh, as you can uh, see that, um, so there are some compounds have very, so in average, all of the individual PPCPs can be removed about 50% from the source water when it's reaching to the uh, finished water. And uh, there are some compounds at, with 100% removal efficiency. And um, all of the list here, the black ones, are the compounds that, um, that when they're showing up in the source water, so they get removed by 100% when they're reaching to the uh, finished water, despite um, the sampling time and the site we're talking about. Um, and the ones that are listing as um, blue found, um, those are the compounds, so they have varied uh, removal rate. Um, we see 100% removal in the site AL, which is the one that with advanced oxidation process. Um, so in other three plants, so their removal rate is much uh, lower. And, um, and there are three compounds have relatively low removal efficiency. We see caffeine estradiol again, so they are again has 100% um, detection rate uh, frequency in the, in the finished water, <clears throat> excuse me, although um, there are concentrations brought up um, to like, uh, like uh, more than half of what we see in the source water. And uh, Cotinine has the lowest removal rate. Uh, it's showing up in uh, two of the plants and its removal rate uh, in average is uh, less than 40%. 
Um, so, and then we also did our analysis to see the whether we can, uh, we are targeting the sulfamethoxazole, which is a widely used antibacterial uh, compound. We want to see whether well-studied um, sulfamethoxazole resistant gene, cell gene, can be used to predict the concentration of sulfamethoxazole. Uh, we did two, um, two types of um, studies. The first one, we used a spike experiment. So we collect water from Cuyahoga River, Cuyahoga River um, at uh, really close to the wastewater affluent of, uh, of one wastewater treatment plant. And we did a spike with uh, 10 microgram per liter and 100 microgram per liter. And we incubate this water for about two weeks. And then we measured the um, expression, uh, the resistant uh, gene expression. So we actually found a pretty good correlation uh, from, uh, from the study. So we feel uh, pretty good. So it might be a good way to, uh, to predict uh, the concentration. However, we are, when we are doing the, um, the in-situ real-time uh, analysis, um, for, uh, we actually don't see a good correlation between the sulfur, uh, between the salt gene and the sulfur mesexual concentration. So uh, I apologize for the busy table, but what I want to say is, you know, we did measure sulfur mesexo, uh in some of the site and some of the time. However, that concentration measurement doesn't match our detection of sulfur mesexo gene expression. Um, so, um, so there are a couple uh, or more than a couple. So there are uh, some uh, explanation that can uh, that I can think of to explain this. One is that. Um, so uh, study have shown that sulfur resistant bacteria, they don't necessarily carry the salt genes. Um, and another thing is maybe sulfur mesexyl gene, their expression um, is in, can be induced by much lower level of sulfur mesexyl concentration, or they can be induced by some other uh, environmental stimuli. So, um, so therefore, uh, for our initial conclusion, uh, we can see that PPCPs are consistently found in both of the source and finished water um, in our drinking water system. Ho however, the concentration is pretty low um, and uh, depending on the time and site, um, so there are different concentrations of PPCPs uh, in our finished water. And our current drinking water treatment method are pretty effective. And um, when the advanced oxidation um, process uh, is combined with traditional method, um, the removal rate of PPCPs can be significantly increased. And, uh, and then we would, um, more study would be needed to, to, uh, to explore uh, the method, uh, to explore the molecular method to predict uh, PPCP concentration. And with that, um, I want to acknowledge our collaborators of our uh, drinking water plant uh, superintendent managers and staff. They are super accommodating of our uh, sampling request. And also I want to thank my, my graduate student, this is Tony that did the meta-analysis and um, Shaoni uh, Dada that uh, is responsible for uh, PPCP distribution measurement and Kai did uh, most of the sampling and also uh, for the antibiotic resistant uh, gene expression analysis. And I also want to thank Dr. Gangoda, who is uh, the expert of LCMS analysis. So we are depending on him to uh, have a good uh, turnout of PPCP measurement. And uh, not last but not least, I want to thank uh, our funding agency, uh, Ohio Sea Grant. Uh, with that, uh, I know this is very fast, um, but with that, I will conclude my uh, presentation. I'll be happy to uh, answer uh, your question. Thank you. All right, well, thank you. Uh, we have gotten some great questions during uh, Dr. Mao's presentation. So let me uh, start going through those. And what uh, questions uh, Dr. Mao isn't able to answer today because of time, we'll uh, post those on uh, the website in, in a, a few, uh, well, within the next couple of weeks. Um, okay, first question. Um, that we've gotten. Um, could you talk a little bit more about where the water samples came from? Oh, so they are, um, they come from, you mean, so the drinking water, um, the source water, let me see. 
Okay, so the source water we are we are getting um, basically, you know, after uh, after the the gate actually from the well before uh, they are adding any of the treatment. So it's actually right before uh, uh, so after the gate. So it's in the uh, in the drinking water uh, like pool in the reservoir. And the finished water we are getting is from the from the tap before uh, their distribution. Okay. Um... Can you talk a little bit about why you chose uh, sulfa drugs over other antibiotics? Oh yeah, so um, because um, so we we picked sulfamethoxazole to study because it is a really well studied, uh, well it's widely used uh, antibiotics, and let me. Yeah. Um, it is really widely used uh, antibacterial uh, chemical compounds, and it has a really well studied uh, sulfur uh, mycelium resistant genes. Um, so, therefore, we have the tools there um, to use. And there are many other compounds that um, don't have very well studied uh, antibiotic resistant genes or uh, the gene primers to start with. So, as the initial effort, we just pick the, the easy access, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Um, could you talk a little bit about why some of the contaminants were easily removed and others weren't? Sure. Um, so the, the, the different compounds, I didn't really list their chemical structure. So their removal because, so they are passing through the different, uh, removal process, depending on the, the chemical structure. So some of the compounds, they are naturally easy to be, uh, to be, you know, removed through the uh, through the uh, the initial like pop like pack of their um, absorption, so that is powder activated carbon. So a lot of those uh, will be removed that way, and also through the uh, when the and also they they are typically going through some chlorine uh, oxidation. So depending on whether the the chemical structure is very stable, some of the compounds um, they have the the ring structure, which makes them a little bit more stable than the other. So they will be a lot more e uh, hard to remove uh, during the process. And also um, they are uh, in the filtration step, uh, we are expecting that uh, some biological uh, activity would happening there. Uh, and again, you know, depending on their chemical structure, so they will be uh, have different, uh, and also depending on which uh, bacterial microorganisms that stay in the filtration system. So that's going to impact on um, their removal. I know this is really superficial, but since I don't have a, I, I didn't really um, put the, the chemical structure here. So, um, so I, I, I can't go really uh, into detail, but the, the answer, the short answer is yeah. So depending on the, the chemical structure of different compounds is actually really impact um, their, uh, their removal rate uh, in the, finished water. All right. Um, would you be able to talk a little bit about um, any of the like established regulatory standards for removal of PCPPs? We've gotten quite a few people asking about that. Um, just like what the baseline is. Um, um, so so although, so this has been, as mentioned, so it has been um, identified as a, a CEC for a while, at least for like several years. However, there's, it is still not regulated. Um, there's still not regulated compounds. So, so um, the, the water treatment or uh, plants are not required to monitor them. So there's no like standards like now. Also, there's no standard yet established to see, okay, this level is safe and that level is not safe because um, again, so all of the, the PPCPs um, that we are measuring now in the drinking water system, so they are at pretty diluted concentration, hundreds and thousands of times diluted than the, their designed um, concentration for use as uh, pharmaceutical compounds. So, um, so there's no immediate uh, house uh, consequences has been found. Um, we are more concerning on the chronic uh, impact. Um, the short answer is um, no. I, I don't. I don't know. There's any uh, regulations on, um, on 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 these compounds yet. Yeah. Okay. Um, would you be able to talk a little bit about? Um, 
Can you explain some examples of uh, PPCPs like bio bioaccumulation? Uh, sure. Um, so Okay, so we have, um, so I put two example here and I can show a little bit, uh, some of the, maybe I should show some a new slide. So uh, I did some like studies on estradiol and caffeine because those are the two compounds that they're showing up also in the Finnish water really consistently. Um, so estradiol is a, a female sex hormone and they are, um, so they are naturally uh, produced by all vertebrate uh, animals. Um, so there are study that has been showing that um, under the natural level, like under the, the environmental level of uh, estradiol that has found in various uh, environments, it, it, can, it can show it's reduced the reproduction rate of invertebrates because it's femalizing uh, the, the animals. So it reduces the reproduction rate. And um, for some, especially for some invertebrate, small invertebrate animals like mussels and oysters, and um, also they can reduce uh, like for, and for example, this is also for like, in, uh, for I think this is for fish and it has, you know, the fish that on, um, sorry, I didn't really prepare this um, um, really well. So, so in like small fish, when they're exposed to um, elevated concentration of extra deal, even though they're still under the environmental like uh, concentration range, you can see, see reduced body weight and length and also has abnormal uh, like various index that showing they might experience reproduction and developmental issues later on. And uh, for bioaccumulation, so so we know, you know, through the food chain, so uh, the, the, um, the various compounds so they can accumulate it into different organs so they can um, be more concentrated than the ambient water uh, in like in livers and in their muscles. Um, and so this is for oysters. So we have seen estradiol um, in a really short time when we dump oyster in the, uh, in the contaminated estradiol contaminated water within 48 hours. Um, with ambient concentration of um, this um, 0 0.005 micro uh, molar level. So they can, in their soft tissue, which, you know, when we eat um, the oyster that we're eating, um, their soft tissue, um, so they can be concentrated um, by more than 80, 30 times. So that will be um, making this to like hundreds, um, sorry, they will be making this to like point, um, uh, to like much higher level uh, to like one point one point something a microgram uh, micromolar and uh, for fish um, same thing so for the estradiol uh, experiment what they see that uh, this is carp study they're uh, using the carp to study and uh, the carp muscle is again so that's the meat the fillet that that we're gonna eat. Um, so they did a chronicle study of that. Um, so at the concentration that is actually pretty low, that's um, within our measured uh, level of concentration. So, so they measured from 10 to 1000 uh, nanogram per liter level uh, for over a year. And they actually see from the low level, they see three times concentration. And then uh, with high level, they see more of the concentration uh, in the fish muscle. So, so by, um, by bioaccumulation, human will be uh, uh, potentially exposed to a higher uh, level of um, the um, some of the compound um, in the uh, in the water. Yeah, right, I don't know whether that this question. Yeah, that was a great answer. Thank you. Um, we've gotten several uh, questions about um, the phase in treatment process. And so let me just kind of summarize a couple of things into one question. Um, were you able to sample during each phase of a treatment process to see the effectiveness of each, for example, the addition of chlorination prior to filtration? Uh, okay. So we, we, um, did not do that. Uh, the reason is this is um, really cost, uh, really costly. So, and we have 
Uh, even with that, we have hundreds of samples to an uh, analysis. So, but that is a that is a great uh, question. So, you know, I would uh, imagine that chlorination they will significantly reduce uh, the PPCP concentration because that is a, a oxidizing uh, compound. Um, but yeah, because that's a good way to test each step. What is uh, you know which step is more efficient in removing this? Uh, we actually did a a, a uh, a side project outside of this um, that uh, I didn't have time to present today, which to see the um, the filtration to see whether the filtration would um, how much of the uh, PPCPs will be removed there. Um, so a, a quick a general conclusion that is yes. Yeah, so the filtration with the uh, uh, with the sand filters and with um, the uh, some GCs here it can remove um, a significantly proportion of uh, PPCPs. So some of the PPCPs are removed uh, at this level. Yeah, but we didn't really have a, a specific stepwise uh, measurement. So okay. that would require a uh, larger funding. <laughs> um, is there a correlation between the number of antibiotic resistant microbes associated with areas of measurable antibiotics in the water? Uh, that is another great question, um, but unfortunately we did not culture bacteria, um, but uh, we only did is uh, antibody resistant gene expression. Um, we did at, at RNA level. Um, so, so we have two, um, again, so we have, we did two types of study for the first study. We basically, uh, We'll see that you know when there is a higher concentration of sulfamethyl sulfur put it in, so the expression level is uh, higher for for the uh, sulfamethyl resistant genes. So so that could be from either there's um, either or um, uh, either um, the the there are more sulfamethyl resistant bacteria and they express at the same level, or they have similar amount of um, sulfamethyl resistant bacteria, but they express at higher level. So, um, so we are using, we're picking at RNA level because RNA is a more, uh, more sensitive way and a more fast uh, immediate way uh, than the DNA level. So uh, however, that uh, will not allow us to, to say whether there are more uh, antibody resistant bacteria when there are more uh, antibody resistant uh, compounds. Uh, sorry, and antibiotics, yeah, antibiotics in the water. All right. Um, do you know if there are uh, PPCPs um, in the settled sludge of wastewater treatment plants? Oh, yes. Uh, PPCPs are definitely there. Um, we didn't study that, but there are uh, many studies that have shown that um, the sludge of the the wastewater treatment is a uh, is a really uh, is a hotspot for for not just PPCPs but for many other uh, contaminants. Yeah, because um, the the sludge uh, is uh, is very important in in terms of either both of the wastewater and drinking water uh, removal process, so that uh, the sludge would um, bring out would take out a lot of the uh, pollutants there. Okay. Um... I'm going to ask two more questions and what question, there's still a, a, several questions uh, left, um, but I will just send those over to Dr. Mao and she will answer those and we'll put those into a Word document um, in the next couple of weeks. So you'll be able to see those answers. Um, one that I, I've gotten this question several times, so I want to just double check um, with you on this. The traditional carbon filtration, um, do those remove these new contaminants from drinking water? Oh yeah, so as, a, as, a, as I showed uh, in one of the slides, you know, so even with the traditional, um, the uh, removing, uh, the traditional treatment train, so it can effectively remove many of the uh, the different uh, PPCP compounds, and even for some of like the compound, like for example, um, butobutol, it can remove by 100% even with the the traditional um, like method that in uh, that can you know have the the carbon 
um, like powdered or granulated active carbon uh, in the process. Yes. Okay. Um, but it's not for all of the compound and some compounds, you know, uh, with the help of advanced method, that's going to definitely help. Okay. Um, could you talk a little bit about the potential human impact from chronic exposure of PPCPs? Uh, human impact? Um, so if I, um, human impact on human or human impact? <laughs> so, <laughs> human say, health uh, impact, human health impact. Okay, chronic impact. Okay, so there is, I have to say there is no, um, so study on that is still coming up. Um, there is no, um, there's no like clear evidence showing that at this low concentration level, uh, any of the compound that's going to causing uh, the issues because, you know, the study is is pretty limited now. And we are talking about really co low concentration. And human has a big body size, like compared to those muscles, we are like thousands of times bigger. So, um, I mean, so there's like for study on the chronic impact um, uh, that will need a much longer time. I, I'm not really aware any of the... Um, study that showing that at this low concentration environmental level uh, that has been uh, like solid work has been done on human health impact but we can suspect we can suspect that you know so if we accidentally eat in some like highly uh, contaminated um, like we're consistently eating like some highly contaminated uh, food uh, you know, so so that probably you know potentially would causing uh, the problem for for human health. So there is a, a clear concern. However, we don't know how big is the concern until uh, further study has been done. But there are solid evidence showing, like for small animals, um, the uh, the impact is really obvious and more uh, short. Sure, you know, we can see them more um, short term compared to uh, the impact on humans. All right. Well, um, thank you. And I, I realized the time, so I appreciate you going over a little bit to answer some more questions. Um, so I will wrap up. Um, I want to thank again, Dr. Mao for her willingness to talk to us today about her uh, research, really an excellent discussion. Also a thank you to Christina Dickus for her work in organizing this webinar series. Um, I would like to remind everyone that our survey URL for this webinar is in the chat feature. So please take a few minutes to fill that out. Uh, this webinar series is sponsored by Ohio Sea Grant and will continue next month with Ohio State University's Brent Saunders who will be discussing the value of Lake Erie beaches. Uh, and that registration link is in the chat. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Mao and all the participants on this webinar. We hope this was beneficial and hope we'll, you'll join us again for an upcoming webinar. Thank you again, Dr. Mao. That was really great. Um, and thank have a great you. afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.